15, 2020. The time is now 7 p.m. Board trustees present are Winfred Adams, Jr., Kelly Hodges, Deborah Jensen, Justine Durant, Jana Gonzalez, Dawn Davis, and myself, Rhonda Newhouse. I would like to ask everyone to turn off or silence their cell phones or any electronic devices. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to recognize Trustee Don Davis, a retired captain of the U.S. Army, to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, and liberty, and justice for all. Face the Texas flag. On the Texas flag, I pledge thee to Texas, one state, one God, one division. At this time, I'm going to call the writing program to the Thank you, everyone. Our next item is the superintendent's remarks. So at this time, I would like to recognize our superintendent of schools, Dr. Rodney Watson. Thank you, President Newhouse and all of the trustees that are here this evening. I thank you for being with us again. We are excited to be here tonight to share with you um, some presentations. We had a, a very lively conversation last Thursday regarding our campus improvement plans and the processes that we go through to develop the plans and to set the goals. Tonight, you're going to hear from three campuses who's going to share and walk with you through their process of setting the goals and strategies for their campus improvement plans. In addition to that, things are going well in our campuses. As we heard last Thursday, we received a lot of what we call gifts from our teachers, letting us know um, the high points and the low points and the things that they need support on um, in our survey. And so as a district, we're continuing to review that data. We are planning to meet with our ACE committee at the end of the month, where we're gonna take those five things to them and help and work with them to help us set the goals and the strategies that we're gonna put in place for them. So for tonight, that does conclude my remarks. We'll jump right into the agenda, Ms. Newhouse. Thank you, Dr. Watson. I'd like to ask any board members if you'd like to make any remarks. Be sure to turn on your mic. Turn your mic on. Once again, can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. President Newhouse, Dr. Watson, my colleagues, it's good to be back together in this, in this particular room again. That's exciting. Tonight, my comments is basically, I'd like to just uh, recognize and, and, and just celebrate our teachers, our bus, our bus drivers, the police department, the Trish Kelly Division, and our custodians. Uh, you know, we always recognize our leadership staff and our administrators, but these are the folks that are the, are the heart and soul of a school district. And I want to just recognize them and tell them thanks for all their efforts and their work they do every day for the success of our students in our free ISD. Those are my comments. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, I am excited and happy to say that I had an opportunity to attend Robeson Middle School's Blue Ribbon Achievement Award. Oh, it was a wonderful moment for Robeson Middle School. I commend their president, their their principal, Tracy Walker, and her staff of teachers on the outstanding job that they are doing at that school. But I also had a chance to see the students in action as they moved about the school. And I was impressed that the students were in line, six feet apart, 
and constantly quietly walking to their different locations. When they came into the cafeteria, they received a to-go meal and went back to their classrooms. And when we told them about the award that they had received, they were just super excited also. So congratulations to all the students at Robeson's, your parents there, you're doing an outstanding job with your child there. And we are most appreciative and very excited for Robeson Middle School, our blue national blue ribbon school. Yes. Um. Madam President, as the parent of a Roberson Middle School student, I want to echo that. Um, and I have a graduate of Roberson, so I want to echo that. Congratulations. I also want to, in this last meeting before Election Day, encourage all members of our community to educate themselves about the candidates that are running for office this election season and get out there and vote. Uh, I recognize that it might be difficult at this time, given the circumstances with the pandemic, but it's really important that you get out there and vote. Thank you. We will now continue with tonight's agenda. Our next item is a points of pride. So at this time, I'd like to recognize our Chief of Innovations and Communications, Tiffany Dunn Oldfield. Good evening, um, President Newhouse, Dr. Watson, and esteemed members of the board. Tonight, we celebrate the fact that the Texas Arts Education Association has again named Spring ISD a District of Distinction. This award is made possible by the awesome work of our Spring ISD performing and visual arts departments and other of the district's incredible campus art teachers. A few of them are Zooming with us tonight to help us celebrate this honor. The District of Distinction Award recognizes a commitment to providing a well-rounded curriculum, one that supports strong visual arts education across all of our schools, all of our grade levels. It was given to just 20 Texas school districts for the very first time last year, and out of more than 1,000 districts, eligible for the 2020 award, only 42 districts met the standard, putting Spring ISD in the top 4% of districts in the state. At this time, I'd like to turn the floor over to tell you a little more about this program is Joe Clark, who I know you know really well, and he has lots of team members here that he wants to introduce and talk about the award. But before I do that, um, Dr. Clark, we have your little award. We have a photo session with you and your team tomorrow so that we can get it into spring wards, but a huge congratulations to you. And I know you have a lot of uh, people to introduce related to this award. Uh, I wish it was in person. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much on behalf of the teachers. Uh, good evening, President Newhouse, honored trustees, and Dr. Watson. Uh, for the second year in a row, the Texas Art Educators Association has invited every school district in Texas to participate in this most rigorous evaluation system um, that anyone has ever developed for, um, to date for a visual art department. TAEA has developed 12 hard criteria for districts to meet. Uh, just for an example, the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo, the huge art show that you have, only meets one criteria. Um, so for a district to be recognized as a district of distinction, a district must meet at least 10 of the 12 highly demanding criteria. Last year, we were very thankful we completed 10 criteria, uh, placing Spring ISD in the inaugural class of the District of Distinction Award for Texas, uh, as Tiffany just said. Uh, this past year, um, during March and April, uh, we had only completed eight of the 10 required criteria um, as, so as schools began to close, as we were trying to determine our next steps as a district, our visual art teachers were trying to figure out how could they provide these opportunities for our students? Like, how do we still go out and provide these great exemplar things for our students and, com and complete the last two uh, criteria needed for this evaluation? Our teachers, who are right here and I'm looking at them, it's so good seeing you guys, um, are led by Amanda Byers and PBA and the PBA department, who's here tonight too, uh, completed 12 out of the 12 criteria. So not only were we two behind during the pandemic and the school closures, we went past the two that we needed and completed two, the, the, the maximum amount. We did all 12 of them of the criteria. Earning Spring ISD its second district of distinction and placing the district in the top 4% of districts for visual art across the state of Texas. 
Now, while I hand the mic over to Amanda, um, I would, and, and she can introduce a few of the teachers who made this possible, we have a surprise for you guys. Um, we do have a gift for you. Uh, so Jeremy, at this time, if you don't mind helping out, we, we do have a gift for all the board members and Dr. Watson. Um, so Jeremy right now should be making his way over to you guys, and he's gonna give you guys uh, a lapel pin. Uh, and so just as a word of caution, uh, this is a, so everybody that gets this is a district of distinction. So the next time that you attend a conference or a board training outside of the district, please don't anticipate a lot of recognition or awe around this pin. Uh, but when they ask you what that pin is, you can just say, oh, you're not in one of the top 4%, are you? So this is uh, only 4% of the districts in Texas have this pin. Uh, so you might have to explain it. So I apologize. But Amanda, I'm going to turn it over to you. And uh, if you could please introduce uh, some of the teachers that are here with us tonight. Amanda. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good evening, President Newhouse, members of the board, Dr. Watson. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to recognize us tonight. We really appreciate it. Collectively, our group of 55 art teachers, we reach over about 21,000 students. And they have worked tirelessly to ensure that these students are receiving a well-rounded um, visual art education. And tonight we have um, three of our visual art teachers with us. Um, we have Fran Taylor, McNabb, we have Ariel Keller from Woods Village, and we have Adrian Kane from Spring High School. And this award would not have been possible without their leadership and the dedication and the perseverance that they have shown. So thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, um, ladies, and um, thank you so much for Spring ISD for understanding the importance of ensuring in a meaningful education and visual arts. Thank you. Thank you so much, and we'll turn it back over to you. May I compliment Amanda Byers on this? Uh, I knew about her from her mom long before I met her. And then I've been to art shows and different uh, things you have uh, organized and produced and just seen the amazing uh, things our kids accomplish with uh, the right tools and the right people and the situation. I just, uh, I wonder, it's wonderful to see them bloom and uh, really uh, do all this. Uh, I gave my uh, granddaughter a t-shirt that says, earth without art is just eh. <laughs> right. Uh, I could also add, um, like, look, there's a lot of talk about STEAM and, you know, integrating art into the other academic disciplines, but I just want to shout out to Dr. Clark for providing art for our students for the sake of the art, you know, as its own discipline. I think. We, we undervalue that in our society. And I really appreciate the emphasis that Dr. Watson, your team puts on the arts. So thank you for that. I too would like to congratulate uh, Joe Clark and his team. It's amazing that some of the things that these students do, you know, from time to time we have artwork in our hallway and it, it is just amazing from our elementary to our high school kids at what, how creative and what they can accomplish. And you guys are giving them that opportunity to express themselves. And thank you so much for everything you do for Spring ISD. It's wonderful. Congratulations. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. And a, and a special quick thank you to Ariel Keller, who uh, is her anniversary tonight. And I convinced her that a great, great anniversary date would be to attend virtually the uh, board meeting. So Ariel Keller and husband, thank you so much for being here. Happy anniversary. Uh, I hope this was romantic. <laughs> thank you, Joe. We are so proud of the work that the Performing Arts Department does in integrating with our core subjects. I think it's a different level of learning for our students. And it seemed to be very successful in incorporating that. So thank you, thank you to your teachers for that. And Amanda and Joe, the next time we get to go to a conference, if that's anytime soon, I'm definitely going to wear my pin because I like to brag on Spring ISD. So thank you. As we continue tonight, our next item is a recognition of outstanding employee service. So at this time, I'd like to recognize our executive 
Chief of District Operations, Mark Miranda. Thank you, Board President Newhouse, Dr. Watson, members of the board. Um, it, is, it is really an honor and a privilege to be able to celebrate the service of two of our long-term employees. We would normally be able to do this in a banquet setting, but times as they are now, we're really happy to be able to do this now here in front of all of these witnesses. And so I'm very excited. Both of these ladies that I'm about to present to you have served Spring ISD for 40 years. And um, so we're really excited to be able to present this. Um, and I do have a couple of awards to present them. We'll get them to them personally here soon. But the first uh, employee to recognize is Mary Sneed. A little bit about Mary, 40 years. Um, and she is most recently from Northgate. Um, as a librarian, her principal, uh, Christy Brown, is also um, online with us. And so, Mary, um, virtually and online, I would love to be able to present this award to you. We are so proud of you and so thankful um, for your service to the school district. I could see you there waving, and um, I'm so thankful for that. The dedication uh, of these individuals uh, cannot be overlooked. Um, 40 years of service, just an amazing time. I didn't know if uh, Mary or Christy or, or anybody wanted to unmute for just a second to say hi to the board as um, we're recognizing you tonight. Good evening, board and Dr. Watson, and thank you for this award. And yes, I started in 1979, Bamel Elementary, doing my student teaching in Spring ISD and was hired at Bamel, uh, taught at Jenkins. Um, Marshall, and then uh, last at Northgate Crossing, open Northgate Crossing and open the library there and was very proud to do that. And thank you, Mrs. Brown, for being here tonight too. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll just add a little bit. Um, Mary is the kind of employee that a principal dreams about having. Um, her dedication and her work ethic and the relationships that she builds with um, children is second to none. Um, she was our librarian, but she was so much more than the keeper of the books. You know, she, she was a fabulous reading teacher and she did an amazing job of piquing the interest of children and making them want to read and want to pick up a book that maybe she had previewed or told them about. So um, because of her, there are many, many grown people out there that are now readers because they had Mary Sneed as their librarian. So it was a pleasure and an honor to be her principal. Thank you very much. Uh, Mary Sneed, let's congratulate her. There's lots of noise going on over here. We're, we're clapping. You, you might not be able to hear us. Um, so the second person that we would like to rec recognize tonight is Pamela Kirby. She is a dyslexia teacher, um, 40 years with Spring ISD. I, think, I believe she has 48 years um, of, of overall service as a teacher. And we're very excited. She's out of the student uh, support services department. And um, Ty Bailey is also here. Uh, representing her as well as her supervisor. Pamela, thank you so much. We honor you and your 40 years of service to the school district. Please uh, unmute if you'd like and say hi. Ty, you may also. Pam, it's the bottom left corner. <laughs> Pam says thank you. She, she doesn't really um, like ath uh, accolades, uh, but I would like to say as her supervisor, she's vital and valuable. Um, she's very dedicated to student learning. As a dyslexia teacher, she's very passionate about struggling readers. Uh, she's all about the students and we appreciate her as a teammate. And uh, I'm so, so blessed to be able to work with her. Thank you. Some of you may notice that comments are also coming in from other principals who have worked with both of these ladies before and just congratulating them um, and their service to Spring ISD. Thank you so much, Ms. Kirby. We appreciate you. I can't wait to get these awards. They're beautiful awards. I can't wait to get these awards to you. 
Thank you, President Newhouse. And thank you, Mr. Miranda. This is quite outstanding, quite an accomplishment to have two employees with over 40 years of service for our, to our district. Uh, we are quite impressed. Thank you both to Mrs. Mary Sneed and Ms. Pamela Kirby. We want you to know we appreciate all that you do for our spring ISD students. Ms. Sneed and Ms. Kirby, thank you. You might not be able to see the smiles behind our masks, but I'm, yes. I'm smiling ear to ear, I promise you. Thank you. For our next item, points of pride for recognition for Robeson Middle School for being named a National Blue Ribbon School. So at this time, I would again like to recognize our Chief of Innovations and Communications, Tiffany Dunn Oldfield. And Tiffany, I hope I didn't take all of your thunder away, but I was so excited to be there that day to see it in person. Absolutely not. It's good that we started the celebrations early on in the meeting because um, this is a really, really big deal. And I know everyone that is um, here tonight in this meeting knows what a big deal this is. So to have it on public record, my team always drafts me these little talkers because they really want me to get these messages across so that um, we can get coverage on this. So this is a really big deal. I'm so glad the celebration started early on. We've been celebrating since this announcement was made. But um, as you were mentioning, our second point of pride this evening recognizes Edward Robertson Middle School, because as was noted, which was one of only 367 schools in the entire nation recognized as a 2020 National Blue Ribbon School by the US Department of Education. This prestigious award um, was awarded to just 26 Texas schools this school year, which recognizes academic achievement and the closing of achievement gaps. That's what the Blue Ribbon Award is about. In addition, Roberson was only one of three Texas middle schools to earn this honor this year and the only middle school in the entire Houston area. The TEA nominated Roberson um, for the award based on both overall student performance and the school's work for promoting greater equity and closing achievement gaps for lower income and minority students. With the announcement of this year's winners, Robertson became the district's first blue ribbon honoree since, wait, 1993, 27 years when Spring High School earned the award. Anderson also won it in 1990 for those who like on that um, trivia for the district. But so 27 years since the last Blue Ribbon Award in the district, this is a really big deal. With its unique math, science and fine arts pathways that balance high academic expectations with re real world applications. The program at um, Robertson cultivate a sense of collaborative ownership and a close knit academic community among students and staff. The National Blue Ribbon Award for Robertson is the result of the extraordinary efforts of so many people associated with the school. Teachers, administrators, counselors, support staff, and others. We're happy to have with us here tonight, Principal Tracy Walker, along with Robertson's Associate Principal and Eighth Grade Assistant Principal, Cecilia Brumsley, both of them have poured a lot of their heart and soul into making this award possible. And we're so happy they could be with us here tonight to help us celebrate for the second time this evening, this enormous achievement for both Robertson and for the school district. And with that, I pass it to the board for some more celebrations. And I would love for Principal Walker um, to um, um, provide us some words too as well. Oh, lastly, I have the award here, have the award too. P pales in comparison to the big seal that's gonna be going on that school, but pairs in comparison, but we will be getting this to you, Ms. Walker. Ms. Walker, would you like to say a few words? Thank you, thank you so much, President Newhouse, Dr. Watson, Board of Trustees and our cabinet. 
Um, we just are excited to be here tonight. We're excited about the award. Um, I'll be honest with you. I did not totally understand the magnitude of the award when Dr. Watson <laughs> called and, and, she, and we talked about it. Um, but I did my research and I learned, you know, all about the award and I realized, you know, it is really, really a major thing to accomplish, but most significantly for myself and for the teachers, the students, the parents, it's really the effort behind it that, that, that means the most for me. Um, we have worked hard. <laughs> we, we work hard. Uh, we're, we're not perfect. We, we aspire to, you know, be the, be the best at what we do because of our students. It's, it's, we're excited about the award, but we really want to just be able to offer what's best and unique for our scholars. We understand that Robertson is a school of choice. So we thank our parents, Dr. Watson, Board Adams, Board Member Adams, and all of our parents in, in the community for choosing to send students to Robertson. Um, and so with that charge, we understand that it is definitely our responsibility to push the envelope at all times, remain innovative, and just offer something non-traditional for students. And so I think that that, I, I just want to just say thank you for all of your support as a uh, district and a community, and we're going to keep working. <laughs> Did any board members want to say anything too? I know we started the congrats a bit earlier, but it is a big deal, and I didn't know if the board members wanted to say anything else, but the, congratulations. This is amazing, amazing. I just wanted to add that uh, when I visited uh, uh, Robertson, it was amazing how uh, much the students worked as well as the teachers, because I saw uh, teachers going between groups of students who were in the hall working on uh, different science projects, and in the room, you know, they were going floating from area to area, and all the kids were on task. As a former teacher, that is just phenomenal. <laughs> I, I don't know if anybody who hasn't been a teacher can appreciate what that is. It meant to me that the kids were absolutely self-motivated and really interested in the work they were doing. And uh, it's just, I think you've got a, a, the magic thing going there, Ms. Walker. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Dunn O'Phil, and thank you, Ms. Walker, and please share congratulations to all of the students at Robertson and your staff, uh, teachers, custodians, everyone, because everybody plays a part in your winning that National Blue Ribbon Award. So please let them know how grateful we are for all of their hard work. We, are, we appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you again. Mm -hmm. Our next item is agenda participation. This item allows members of the public an opportunity to speak on agenda items before those items are considered by the board. Mr. Brinkley, do we have anyone registered to speak under agenda participation tonight? No, Madam President, we do not. Okay, thank you. So we will continue with our agenda. Our next item is the public hearing for the Spring Independent School District State Financial Accountability Rating. So at this time, I'd like to recognize our Chief Financial Officer, Ann Westbrooks. Thank you, President Newhouse. Good evening, members of the board and Dr. Watson. Tonight, we will discuss the Financial Integrity Rating System of Texas, which is commonly referred to as the School First Report. The law requires each school district to prepare an annual financial accountability report within two months of receiving the official ratings. Each school district must announce and hold a public hearing to distribute the results of the report. A copy of the report is included in your board packet on page 13. 
The School First is a financial accountability rating system that holds school districts accountable for the quality of their financial management. It's designed to encourage better management of financial resources in order to ensure that the maximum amount of funds are made available for direct instructional purposes. This rating system was used to assess the district's 2018-2019 fiscal year and consists of 15 base indicators that analyze trends related to financial management efficiencies. The first five indicators are answered with either a yes or a no answer, while the remaining indicators are assigned a point value. Each indicator is weighted equally with the exception of the first five. Failure to comply with any of the first five indicators results in an automatic failure. And just as a note, over the last few years, indicator number five has not been scored and is, was not scored as part of this rating either. So it is my honor to announce that for the 2018-2019 fiscal year, Spring ISD achieved a rating of A, which of course is the highest rating and represents superior achievement. The first report also includes six required disclosures, and these disclosures will be located in the appendix at the end of the first report. Those six disclosures are a copy of the current superintendent's employment contract, reimbursements that were received by the superintendent and board members for fiscal year 2019. And as a note, these reimbursements are related to business travel that was incurred on behalf of the, when the board members or the superintendent were traveling on behalf of the district in their official capacities. The third disclosure is out, any outside compensation and fees received by the superintendent for professional or consulting or any other personal services. And as a note, there are none. There's the fourth disclosure is a listing of any gifts that are valued above $250 that were received from outside vendors by the board, the superintendent, or any of their immediate family members. And I'll also note that there are none. The fifth disclosure is a listing of any business transactions between our board of trustees and the district, and there were none. And lastly, the final disclosure is any additional information that the board of trustees deems useful uh, to the community, and there was no additional information disclosed. A copy of this report will be on the district's financial transparency website this week, so our community members will have an opportunity to read through it and provide any opportunity to ask questions of the board or of the administration regarding what's included in the report. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bliss Brooks. Mr. Brinkley, do we have anyone registered to speak on this agenda under public hearing? No, Madam President, we do not. Thank you. So we will continue for our next item. I would again like to recognize our Executive Chief of District Operations, Mark Miranda. Hi, President Newhouse, uh, Dr. Watts, members of the board. Last uh, Thursday, we had a great PowerPoint delivered to introduce the campus improvement plans um, to us. Um, I do believe you have a flash drive and some other information in front of you. What we wanted to do tonight was to be able to share from three of our campuses um, their campus improvement plans to get kind of a feel for what they went through and the development and their um, strategy that, that they have for their campuses. So we're going to do that and um, we'll go from there. So we have three, three campuses. We'll be taking a look at um, Marshall Elementary School um, with uh, Mike Walker and then we'll go to uh, Diaco Melendez with Spring High School, and then Corey Lede with Bamel Middle School. So first up for you is Mike Walker, uh, Principal Marshall Elementary School. Mike. Mr. Walker, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. All right. Good evening, President Newhouse, members of the board, Dr. Watson, cabinet members, and guests. My name is Mike Walker, 
I'm the proud principal of Gloria Marshall Elementary, and it is my privilege tonight to represent our elementary principals and present Marshall's campus improvement plan. As you know, all effective plans begin with a comprehensive needs assessment. When reviewing our students' academic needs, we identified specific and intentional strategies to increase their success. Our BOY data, which was an end of year test, already identified students who were at least approaching grade level expectations. From this data, we set our goal as follows. In reading, from 29% meets to 44% meets. In math, from 25% meets to 40% meets. In writing, from 22% meets to 37% meets. And in science, from 15% meets to 30% meets. Tonight, I'm gonna to share some of the targeted strategies that will ensure our students meet their academic goals. Marshall is implementing intentional individual student goals. Our purpose here is to allow our students and their parents to engage with their BOY scores and understand how much they are expected to grow between now and the STAR exam. This is a research-based strategy. As Dr. Doug Reeves stated in Accountability in Action, students need to engage with their own growth goals. This specificity per student also helps student parents to track their progress. This will allow us to have data-driven conversations with students and parents, not just our teachers. Having done turnaround work in the past, the goal is to have the campus exude what Dr. Doug Rees refers to as a culture of accountability. We will do celebrations at checkpoints and benchmarks for students who have reached their goals. This has been a very high leverage activity that has yielded strong student gains and other turnaround work that we've led. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. All right, so you can see here, Robert Marzano and John Haiti have been both researched in what teaching strategies make the biggest difference to students' results. Marzano's findings are based heavily on student design assessments, while Hattie's findings make more use of standardized tests. While they have used different methods and terminology, they agreed on these eight powerful strategies. So the first strategy is a clear focus on the lesson. And this means that it makes sure that students know what they're supposed to learn before they even begin learning. And number two, offer overt instruction. This is basically direct instruction, but it includes practice and it makes sure that we show exemplars. Idea three, get the students to engage. This allows the students to connect learning to past learning. So you make sure that they actually uh, connect what they're learning now to what they've learned prior to. And then of course, idea four, giving feedback. This gives students precise information on how they're progressing in their work. Idea five, multiple exposures. This lets students see learning concepts several times in different formats. Idea six, have students apply their knowledge. This requires students to use what they've learned to solve real world problems. Idea seven, getting students working together. This allows students to engage in cooperative learning. And finally, idea eight, build student self-efficacy. By ensuring students know you believe they can successfully complete a task. And of course that you is the teacher. As research-based strategies, the focus is to have students make meaning out of the lessons and concepts that they're engaged in each day. They will be clear on what they're supposed to learn, engaged in their learning, and confident in their knowledge and skills. 
As Marshall Marlin, parents, students, and teachers partner together to complete each of these big ideas, we will see increased student learning as measured by our progress monitoring trackers. As you can see, I presented one of the high leverage strategies from the Marshall CIP as to not take up all of the time in presenting. I will now turn this over to Spring High School's principal to share some of her strategies. May we ask questions at this point? Absolutely. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So Walker. you don't get off that easy, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Walker, uh, yes, I just love your eight big ideas. I, I'd like to uh, ask a little bit more about a couple of them. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I, I love the idea of getting uh, students to engage. You said that's where they meet the real world. Right. So that they find, uh, can you give me an example from your school uh, in any, any subject area? Right. So, so the idea is with the, with the engagement, the idea is to maybe connect the work that they're doing now to something that they've already done. I mean, there's a lot of ways to engage. But one of the big pieces we're, we're focusing on is making sure that we engage them by getting them to connect what they're doing now with something that they've done before. So it could be integration. Um, I mean, of course, we're doing the kale at all of um, our lower grades in particular, but uh, we mentioned that with, um, with what Mr. Clark is talking about, but how do we connect all of the things real world to, to what they're currently doing? to make meaning out of the work. Because a lot of times, if we just do things in isolation, then the kids really don't have any understanding of it. Why does this matter? So it's about really, all of these really work in tandem because it's really about setting up the lesson, um, all of those pieces. I mean, I'm going old school now, but we talk about, you know, Dr. Madeline Hunter and that whole piece. Um, so, yes, projects. Yeah, I think those connections are so important that you're describing. Uh, also, um, having been a high school teacher, uh, I frequently got the question, why do we have to learn this stuff? Yes, ma'am. I, I doubt that the kids, it's, once you ever <laughs> ask that question, it seems like their yeah. education is so tied to the real world. So I'm excited about that uh, idea for your kids too. Yes, uh, the other idea I, I thought was really interesting you put on here was the number eight, build students self-efficacy because um, uh, when I was doing workshops with teachers, one of the things that really stood out is that students who say that teacher gave me a C, uh, and then other students would say, I made a C, I'm going to have to study harder, I'm going to have to work harder. Guess which group of students was far more likely to succeed? I think you really are hitting a, a big one there. So uh, uh, congratulations and good luck this year. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Good evening, President Newhouse, Board of Trustees, Dr. Watson and Cabinet. Uh, it is my pleasure to discuss with you Spring High School's CIP and represent the high school team this evening. Uh, Mr. Walker, if you could uh, stop sharing your screen. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm gonna discuss Springs High School's plan. I actually, uh, you have it uh, to reference, but I wanna talk first about the needs assessment. Um, one of the things in this pandemic that we really looked at when we were developing the CIP was a needs assessment from a completely different lens. And one of the things that we quickly found was not just a disconnect with students and their access to technology, but that our students are app savvy versus tech savvy. Um, we often assume that students, because they're millennials or growing up in the 21st century, know how to navigate through technology. Well, they know how to navigate the apps on their phone, but not necessarily always the technology that's needed to translate over into the educational arena that we learned in the spring. So in our needs assessment, we really looked at meeting kids where they were for the 21st century and making sure that we're creating lessons and goals and strategies that embody that for our campus and for our high school students as they make that transition uh, to secondary, post-secondary education for us. So in our needs assessment, we made sure that our students uh, had the accessibility and the access. We appreciate the district's extreme efforts to provide Chromebooks and hotspots and technology for our students. I can't tell you how much that means to our families who have the opportunity to be connected and make choices that are best for them 
based on our ability as a district to provide those resources. So thank you uh, to the Board of Trustees for providing that for our students. It is greatly appreciated. So in the needs assessment, um, we also established that we have kids that are going to make the choice to be at home and we have kids that are going to make the choice to be at school. And so as teachers and as administration, we have to balance that and what does that look like? And then how do our strategies align with that? So we also had to make sure that we had a baseline for learning. And so for us, because there wasn't a STAR assessment in the spring, we have the BOI for us. And I have to say, just in talking to my colleagues in other districts, that we're being pretty proactive by administering a BOI and having that baseline data, having something that allows us as a campus and as a district to look at our progress throughout the course of the school year. So we're taking the baseline data from the BOI and looking at our 2018-19 STAR data as well, and then making a determination of what our goals will be. And for us at Spring High School, our academic goals are to uh, go from, in our English one, go from 19% on the BOI meets to 40% on STAR, 3% um, masters to 13%. For our English two, we want to go from our fall BOI at 27% to 46%, masters from 2% to 12%. For biology, we want our BOI to go from meets at 21% to 58% on STAR, and masters from 2% to 12%. And then our US history goal, our fall BOI from 23% to actually 82% on STAR, because we believe that we can make that uh, jump based on our previous 2018-19 STAR scores. So when we talk about instructional strategies with virtual learners and in-person learners, one of the things that we're doing on our campus is establishing virtual interactive notebooks in our English classes. And so um, one of the things that we have really found is that we're not gonna have kids walking around with paper and pencil uh, online at home or quite honestly, even on the campus. Um, they're gonna come with their supplies and they're necessary, but they're gonna really interact with their Chromebooks and their technology. So establishing those interactive notebooks for our students. One of the things that we also looked at our strategies uh, is making sure our co-teach model for our special education students is up to par in this virtual platform as well as the in-person brick and mortar. Um, it's no secret that we definitely have room to grow on our campus uh, in special education performance on our assessments. And so really looking at how to utilize that partnership, whether it's the parallel teaching model or the teach one, assist one model that we are really embracing those strategies for our special education students. And then also looking at how to replicate that model for our ELL students too as well. We've looked at tail pass, um, data as well. We want to really make those those strides. And then one of our other strategies that we're highlighting is, Dr. Jensen, you'll appreciate this one, is virtual lab experiences for our students. Uh, we know that kids really thrive in science when they have the ability to interact with the material. And so establishing those virtual strategies, those virtual labs, we're even using TikTok. Um, I can tell you phosphate, compound sugar, Wait, I'm losing the dance. It's phosphate, compound sugar, something. I had it the other day, but <laughs> the kids do really good on the quiz. Um, we made a TikTok for them and just really meeting them where they are and helping uh, bridge that gap. And our teachers are really embracing it. And then not just the academic strategies and the focus for our goals, but also highlighting our social emotional goals for the school year, as well as our CCMR for the high schools. And so for CCMR, one of the things I'm excited and ecstatic about is the opportunity for our students to receive dual credit. Um, because of the pandemic, normally students have to be TIS ready, but because of the pandemic, uh, there is a waiver that all students that have earned an A or a B in their uh, course the previous year at Lone from the high school can actually take the courses at Lone Star. And so we have a whole cohort of kids that we are targeting, 400 kids as a matter of fact, for the spring semester to take humanities and English or US History 1301. So when we talk about our CCMR numbers and our accountability, and just quite honestly, the opportunity for kids to leave high school with those credits, um, we're very excited about that. And then lastly, from our uh, parental and community uh, lens and our parental support and our social emotional is making sure that we are continuing to work with our families and our students. And we are offering forums every six weeks 
it's where we just listen to the kids, tell us, you know, what's going well, what's not going well. Um, same thing with the parents. We have one tomorrow with the parents, um, and we do this every six weeks. We do a survey pre previous to the six weeks uh, ending, send that out, and then we have a forum with the parents. Okay, this is what you told us is going well. This is where we need to grow. Can we talk a little bit deeper about what that looks like so that we can make those uh, strides for our campus? And so the CIP this year, I appreciate the ease of it. Uh, and the format that we selected as a district, I felt like it was really allowed us to focus and narrow in on what we needed to bring Spring High School up to the next level. And so that is just a few highlights from our CIP. If you have any questions, I will be more than happy to field those at this time. This is Trustee Duran. Can you tell me a little bit about the virtual interactive notebook and how that works? Okay, so Google Docs has a platform where you can go in um, and actually use Google Slides too as well. And so the kids are very familiar with the Google platform and the interface that we use. And so you take one copy of the master notebook, the virtual notebook, and then each student makes a copy of that notebook. So this is where they take their notes for the day. This is where they can drop and add links for information that they may be researching. They can also create their interactive notebooks and the teacher can go into the notebook and make comments on their work, the students can go in and make comments to uh, each other's work. So if you think about an English class and students doing writing and doing peer review, you have the ability for students that are at home to actually be interacting with a student that may be sitting face to face in the classroom and offering feedback and input on their writing. So the kids really like it. They can take it everywhere they go. It's in their Chromebook on their phone. So they can even be in the cafeteria discussing it and working on it in real time. That's fantastic because it gives them, that's what, what I was seeking, if it gives them an opportunity to interact with one another, because virtually a lot of them are missing that interaction. And so this is an opportunity for them to be able to do that. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm a little late to this, so forgive me, but um, I'm looking at the Marshall uh, Campus Improvement Plan. I'm looking at page four. Um, and I have some questions about how we set goals. Um, I'm looking at for reading, for example, for grades three through five, our plan was for 10% uh, percent growth at the meets levels on STARS. Um, but when I look at how this is broken down, it looks like we're sort of planning. Oh, I don't see where we're addressing the achievement gap. And so we have our Africa, our goal for our African American students is 48% meets. Uh, that is the, outside of SPED, that's the lowest expectation we have. It's lower than the English language arts expectation, which is only five points lower than our expectation for white students. And so I'm wondering how we arrived at our goals in our campus improvement plans. I know I, it took me a while to get to this, so it might be. Did, did you want me to speak well, to that? Yes. So just for Justine, the link that I, I was trying to access it through the link, and the link either is really slow or I couldn't access it, but I was able, there's a, a flash drive they provided us. Um, if you can get somebody to plug it in, I had to get mine plugged in in the back. Okay. Yes, sir, Mr. Walker. Yes, sir. Thank you. So, so those are the federal targets. So what we normally do with those is we add, just like I did for the overarching goals for the meets, we add 15, our goal is to always add 15 points. So that's where we arrived at those. What, whatever they were last year, we push them up 15 points. So my concern, Mr. Walker, is that um, for our African-American students and for our Hispanic students, we need to do a bit more. Um, so what, what it looks to me like we did was we had the kids standing at the fence trying to look into the game and we put the same box under everybody. That's what it looks like to me. And as a parent, that's of concern. Okay. So, yeah, like I said, we, we really just set those targets to add 15 to wherever they, they were the year before. So I totally understand that. We, we definitely want to outshoot all of those goals for all of our students. But the state sets the threshold for what, you know, the original targets should be what we need to meet. So 
my concern is that whatever the state guidelines are, it's not enough for our children. It's just not, it's just insufficient. We're, we're, we're leaving African American and Hispanic kids behind. And if, you know, whatever the state's plan is, I feel like we need to do a bit better than that. And if I'm speaking out of turn here, somebody please give me some pushback. But I see us planning to have an, an achievement gap. And it might be a goal that is out of our reach, but I do believe we have to be more aggressive in goal setting to close the gap. We can't keep doing the same thing we've been doing and setting the same expectation for everybody and not closing that gap. Mr. Landis, so, I, so I definitely understand what you're saying, uh, Mr. Adams. So one of the things that we can do is as we're looking at setting the goal for all, it kind of goes back to, um, I think, something that our comment that someone had made a while back about a BHAG goal. In previous years, we've set goals for all kids to be um, at the same level. And it was unrealistic and that did not happen. And so what I hear you saying, which I wish we agree as we're looking at equity across, is that as we're looking at the goals, we also have to keep in mind of the other special populations or subgroups to ensure we're not um, unintentionally causing some based upon the expectations we have for certain groups to be lower. And so that's something that, um, as we know, these plans are a living documents. We can go back through and look at that for all of the campuses. Right. I'm, I'm seeing this again, I'm looking at this as a parent, but the other thing you have to keep in mind is this is a document that we're trying to put in front of teachers. So we're saying to our teachers that it's okay for African-American students to be 12 points behind white students. And I just don't think that's what we should be doing from a macro level. And again, if it is unreasonable or if it's a if it's a BHAG for us to expect African American students to close the gap and to to get more growth than we've been getting from them, then I just think we have to set that goal and fail at that goal. I don't want to fail at a goal that is already 12 points behind. So if I'm looking at this correctly, we're talking what we've applied here is 10% across the board, correct? An increase uh, for the school, yes, that's what growth, he did. Right. He, he did 15 percent. He did 15 percent. Yeah, so absolutely, we'll go back through, and um, uh, Mr. Miranda will work with the campuses uh, to look at that and to set those so the goal per subgroup is commensurate with all of them. So can I ask something that? I don't know how obtainable it is, but I want to be consistent about the growth that we're asking them to make. So I don't think we should shift that around, but I think is there another area or another way in which we can attack that gap and, and close that gap without setting um, variant, various goals. I think we should, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with setting us a percentage for all. Yeah, they're definitely. But I also understand what Trustee Adams is saying that we do still need some sort of measurement to address the gap that we see between our students. Absolutely. And is there another area in which we can incorporate that in the plan? Yeah, there are ways that we can look at that. And some of it is, you know, as we're looking at closing achievement gaps, not all the time the achievement gaps get closed in one year. Mm -hmm. And so it's taking. I'm making up something, but if there's a 15% difference between um, populations, then it is looking at over a period of a couple of years or three years, closing those incrementally, incrementally right. to get to a certain point. I think there was a campus or someone that was presenting at the TASB conference and they were really focused on equity and they looked at their work over a three to five year period. Mm -hmm. And they really looked at how they closed those achievement gaps. And it really was um, doing intentional work, not, uh, not just setting the goal, but looking at what Mr. Adams has said again in previous conversations, really looking at resources and interventions and, interventions and, and support right. to right. really help put more emphasis in that area with teachers so they are able to close those gaps over a period of time. Right, right. Mr. Miranda, did you want by any chance for um, Dr. Cobb to talk a little bit about some of the goal setting and how the overall goal setting also gets at some of the, the district's goals for closing achievement gaps? 
Yep, I did see Dr. Kyle jump on. I do think she has some thoughts on this. So thank, thank you. you, Dr. Kyle. You're on mute. Let me try that again. Good evening, everyone. I think the I think all the points made are valid ones. I think that um, we are challenged by domain three. That requ that is what um, I think Mr. Walker based his, his numbers off of, which creates that inequity in the goals that are being set by the state. And I think it's important that uh, to all of what you are saying is that we do need to focus on that. And I think you'll see that you saw that probably um, as you finally got a chance to dive into that binder that we provided you, that we're going to be analyzing the data systematically to look for the gaps that um, not just the um, African American gaps, but there's also gender gap or sex gaps between groups and then by ethnicity by uh, gender or sex that is also occurring. Um, the special ed gap, of course, is a, a huge one and one that we need to address um, thoroughly and systematically. And so I think as we go through the school year, you'll be seeing us intentionally bringing those gaps up and having conversations instructionally about how that can be addressed, as well as anything that we have systemically that helps um, helps bridge those gaps or in, in the other terms um, also creates gaps that, we, that are unintentional. Thank you for that, Dr. Cobb. Um, I just, I think my concern is um, this is a document that we produced and the, a continuation of the gap is embedded in the document. Um, and I just, I, we have to be more mindful of that, I think. I would completely agree, but I, but I know the, the source from that is domain three. For TEA, so just so that you know where the come from is, that's the come from. But we hear you loud and clearly that we need to rise above those gaps that they've created for us. So, is it not possible for us? Would it have been inappropriate for us to, um, again, adjust the size of that box that the child is standing on? I, I think Dr. Watson's point earlier is is the the most valid one is that a year time maybe for some gaps will be too hard to do in a year. Um, however, over time and with some systematic focus, it's not unreasonable to ask. Thank you. Okay, so I'll go ahead and hand it over to Mr. Lede. If there's no other questions for Spring High School. Mr. Lede. I All did right. have a question I'm sorry. for Spring High. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I did have a question for Spring High, and I think uh, Trustee Durant's question uh, halfway in answered it. Uh, with your kids taking dual credit courses, which are really challenging, uh, is there any way that they have to collaborate and be in study groups? It just seems to me, uh, from personal family history, as a teacher, as a you know workshop person. It always seems that uh, if uh, people can uh, form uh, not a group where one person does the work, which I've seen before too, but where uh, everyone is collaborating, that they're, everybody's successful. So I, I'm just concerned about other uh, academic areas where the dual credit courses are going on. Yes, ma'am. So one of the things that we've encouraged the kids to do, and we actually have, um, you know, GT coordinator for our campus that works with identifying the kids um, is that we have breakout sessions um, where we share with those kids those resources on how to balance that load um, because kids that are in dual credit are often in advanced placement classes as well some of them are taking five or six classes I'm watching it happen with my own 15 year old daughter um, and they are actually utilizing zoom and google meets and to be honest have been doing it for quite some time um, you know, with each other working together, um, we kind of have what we call like the little coffee chats, where we have the kids come in, discuss with us, um, you know, any concerns. I can say that because a lot of the kids, you know, are at home, 
uh, versus in person that I don't think that that stress that they would normally have uh, is as much as it has been in the past because, you know, it's a little bit easier when you're waking up in your own house, getting, you're not getting on the bus and getting up at five o'clock in the morning and balancing that load. So we haven't seen that burnout sometimes that we see around this time of year with kids taking all of those classes. I think that what has really honestly happened is that as adults, we've really met the kids where they needed to be met. This has forced us to really um, dig deep to put those resources available to kids in a way that they can receive them. Um, you know, and as I tell my staff all the time, we never need to go back all the way to how it was. Um, we would be doing kids a disservice if we just go all the way back to where, how we were doing things. This is our opportunity to get it right. Um, and, you know, we really have embraced that with our students. Thank you, because I'm very worried. I think um, 11th and 12th grade are so stressful anyway. And I was wondering how uh, all our alternative teaching methods right now are affecting everybody. But uh, I'm just very excited about all the courses you're offering and uh, the way you're able to uh, meet your students that where yes, they are. Yes, we're excited. And I'm really impressed right with here. your comment that we want to meet them where they are and we don't ever want to go back to where we were because what we were doing wasn't necessarily really working for us and so i think even though this pandemic has been a negative experience for us overall it's given us some great opportunities you know to do things more innovative and i think better engaging for our students because they're 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 technology driven you know and it's it's meeting them exactly where they are and I like that we're taking advantage and um, capitalizing on, on the opportunity to better engage them at that level. So. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. And the same thing for parents. I mean, the level of engagement yeah. for parents this year, um, you know, we're talking hundreds and hundreds of parents, uh, you know, logging into Zoom and participating in meetings where, you know, before you could get maybe 20 or 30 people in person. So definitely is a ball we don't want to miss and we want to hold on to and build the momentum for us uh, on our campus as well as in the district. Yeah, and we were already kind of ahead of the game in our district and, and, and having a virtual school already in place. And so just being able to build upon that um, is exciting. So I, I had a question. I would I hope this doesn't take us off course, but how are we checking in with the kids um, to get feedback from them to see how they're feeling, if they feel like they're learning? I mean, are we doing some sort of daily or weekly check-in? And is that data being uh, shared and analyzed so that we can adjust what's working and what's not working? So, Ms. Ms. Melendez, we're going to call you Ms. Carter. Ms. Melendez, will you talk about, I know you had shared a few minutes ago how you do your surveys with your students and check-ins. Talk a little bit more about how you all do that as well. So for us at Spring High School, um, of course, we have, you know, we start almost all of our classes with good things. Um, you know, just the social, emotional, how are you doing? Um, to start our class off. But more specifically, what we do offer is our kids were part of the establishment of our vision on our campus. So actually in the summertime, we had kids that logged in and they talked about, you know, what they wanted Spring High School to look like. And we really took that to heart. Um, they talked about things from, you know, I want adults to assume the best about me, to I want to be involved in, you know, when teachers are making lessons about things that I'm going to learn, you know, I would love to have some input on that. And so um, we took all of that feedback. And so for us on the campus, we meet with our kids uh, in forums every six weeks. And so we have, um, like I stated, the parent one and the staff one is Wednesday for us. And then next Wednesday, we'll have the student forum. And so we give a survey out every six weeks. Um, and they're basic questions. It's no more than 10 questions, but it's, you know, have you reached out to an adult and somebody has returned, you know, the message or reached back out to you in less than 24 hours? Um, is there something that you need from a teacher that you haven't been able to get? Um, how can we specifically um, interact with you virtually? One of the things that we're doing Friday is a virtual pep rally. Um, you know, and it sounds kind of crazy, but, you know, we have the band, we have the cheerleaders, we have some of the staff doing TikToks. We're ready because this is the year we're beating Westfield. Um, and so <laughs> we're really getting ready, but we're, you, one of the things that I, I'll say this, and I don't want to, you know, monopolize the time, but 
I asked the kids specifically, why, why would you want to stay home? Why would you want to come to school? Talk to me about, you know, that social aspect that you might be missing. And you know what they said, and it really took me aback was Miss Melendez, you have to understand that our world is on the phone already. Um, it's you all who don't understand that most of what we do with each other is, is on our device. We're not missing that, you know, because I'm like, don't you want to see your friends and do this? And, you know, are you lonely? And they're, you know, no, they're not. Um, and I think for some kids that have selected to come back and as we bring more kids back and make that transition back to the more normal day to day, um, you know, I think kids will realize the things that they have missed but a lot of our kids are, are thriving. And for the kids who are not, um, one I thing I can share is Denise Zimmerman um, has shared with us resources for the district and for our kids, for kids who are struggling, because there are some kids that this is, this is a lot. It's a pandemic already. Um, and then you're taking that situation and your, your school is in person or it's a couple of days a week. And so it's, it's, for some of our kids, it is a struggle. And so we do have resources. Our counselors have done a great job. The district afforded each counselor $250 to um, spend specifically on social emotional resources for kids and staff members who may be stressed out during this time. So we're, our, we are checking in with them. Um, they have no problem whatsoever now that everything's digital, letting me know if something isn't happening or when something is happening, they'll tell me, Ms. Melinda, thank you, this was taken care of. So they are actually advocating for themselves, which is a good thing. That's a great skill to take into adulthood. Thank you. I do want to go back, um, you know, as I was sitting here listening to uh, Ms. Melendez, um, go back to Mr. Adams' question. So one of the things, as we look at equity, um, across the district, and this is a major focus, you know, we've all got to get comfortable with asking those hard questions like he asked, um, because there was nothing, you know, and I know, I don't need to say this to this group, but I think there needs to be an understanding of as we're looking at our data, these are the types of conversations that we've got to continue to look at. Those are the types of questions that we've got to ask, because as we're looking at that, it's easy for us to set um, goals as we're looking at with domain three that um, TA virtually sets um, gives us the indication of what to set so we're, we, we meet those, um, those necessary projections. However, that's the whole purpose of this equity audit. It's going to show us more. It's going to put the mirror up and show us the gaps that we have in achievement and the gaps we may have in our curriculum and the gaps, all of those things that perpetuate the mindset of that. And it's going to be a mindset shift. And so, um, you know, I want to make sure that we didn't leave that conversation just in a quiet space because that's the hard conversations that we have to have and that we need the board to continue having with us and pushing us uh, to make sure that we're setting equitable goals. We said that we want excellent, equitable um, student achievement across all of our schools. And we've got to make sure that not only we understand, but our teachers understand that we want those closed. And we want to do some specific things. And as we're looking at that, that goes into our budgets and making sure that our budgets are equitable based upon the population and the, and the goals that we set. And so um, I wanted to let you know, uh, Mr. Adams, I heard you. Um, I definitely respect you for bringing that up. Don't stop asking those hard questions. We're accountable for that. And as we get further into our work with equity, these are the conversations team that we're going to continue having. So I just want to make sure everyone gets used to that because we're going to continue hearing them and having them. Well, I want to commend you for circling back to that because it is still echoing in my head. It was, it was, it was a very insightful and um, powerful question, and I really appreciate it. And it's got me thinking, you know. So um, sometimes those tough conversations they may be tough, but they're the right conversation. And I, I believe that all of my colleagues and I have in our hearts what's best for kids and I believe the administration does as well. So we can have those tough conversations and we can resolve that and who wins in the end of those tough conversations are our scholars. Mr. Lede, the neophyte principal. <laughs> All right, good evening board president Newhouse, uh, board of trustees, Dr. Watson and cabinet. Thank you for giving me this opportunity uh, to present the campus improvement plan for Bama Middle School and to represent uh, the middle school cohort. And so, as you all know, uh, I arrived uh, to Bama Middle School, um, I want to say at the end of July. And one of the things that I said, even in my interview, is that I'm going to embrace everything that comes with Bama Middle School. And with that being said, I knew coming in, especially after one of our busy, I mean, the, the worst pandemics uh, that 
U.S. has actually experienced that we were going to have some challenges. And every day, uh, I would say that myself and also the admin team, we are just looking forward to changing those uh, challenges to opportunities. And so we had an opportunity to um, actually do a, an, a survey to all of our parents out in the community. And some of the things that we uh, identified and actually helped us uh, with um, creating this campus improvement plan was, is that we, we recognize that approximately 81% uh, of our students um, lacked an electronic device. And as uh, Ms. Melendez stated, I wanna take this time to say thank you uh, for you know, uh, giving us all the technology as far as Chromebooks, uh, hotspots, et cetera. But we also knew that we had to do something on campus as well. And so we've been working day in and day out uh, just getting our, um, our computer labs up to par so that when kids are coming to campus and let's say if they leave their Chromebook or they just need additional assistance that they will have an area right here in the school um, to meet their educational needs. More importantly, we also recognize that parents struggle with providing academic support for their students at home. And so one of the things that we incorporated this year was our parent university where we actually get on live uh, with parents and actually walk them through all of the different uh, resources that we're using on campus, uh, preferably, you know, Schoology and all of the ins and outs of Zoom and, and, and all those things. Um, one of the things that I also want to highlight, and I'll talk about it a little later um, when we get to our uh, high lever leverage strategies, was we had two initiatives that I feel pretty good about. Uh, the PAC, which is it's, uh, an acronym that stands for Parents, Academics, Athletics, and the Community, and also the Troy Project, where we focused on some of our Tier 3 and uh, Tier 2 and Tier 3 behavior students, and we we're actually putting them in leadership roles uh, so that they can do great things, not only in the school, but also in the community. The other challenge that we looked at was students were required to take on additional roles and responsibilities at home. And so each and every day, we talk to our teachers about the importance of being flexible and keeping the main thing the main thing, right? And so we wanna make sure that we do everything that we can to assist with uh, making sure that all of our kids' uh, needs are met and that we continue to, to bridge all of the gaps. Um, just two additional um, challenges also, uh, just in terms of the school is that, you know, I don't know if everyone is aware, but 48% of our staff has two years or less of experience. And so we have to be very intentional about providing them uh, with the support needed. And so my team has actually put on different surveys throughout the campus and just basically soliciting feedback from our teachers and actually asking them, you know, in order for you to, to, to bridge these gaps, what do you need to be successful? And so I am pretty excited. I am very excited, excuse me, about our uh, professional development calendars that we are actually incorporating to uh, address uh, initial instruction, but more importantly, to assist all of our new uh, teachers on campus. And so with all of that, we basically took all of that feedback and data and we actually uh, created our academic goals for the upcoming year. And so by June of uh, 2021, or let's just say for the 2020-21 school year, um, our goal is from reading grades six to eight is at the meets level to raise uh, student achievement from 21% to 31%, math uh, grades six to eight from 18% to 28%, and writing uh, from 14% to 24%, and science, 22% to 32%, and last but not least, social studies from 12% to 22%. And so now I wanna take the time out to just kind of highlight some of the uh, high leverage strategies that we actually uh, chose uh, for our campus improvement plan. And I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm excited about all of them, but more importantly, I'm excited about our multi-tiered uh, system of interventions. And so again, we're gonna go back to our BOI uh, data. Right? We knew that that was the baseline data. And so a lot of times people are looking at the percentages and scores. But one of the things that we realized was is that at the beginning of the year, we have a, a large, uh, I would say a, a nice size, a uh, nice group of students that are actually at the approaches level, right? And also at the meets level. So one of the things is, is we went through our data and identified those individual students. And we know at the very least, we're gonna move all of our students that are currently um, 
at the approaches level, we know that we can get them the meets. And all the kids that are at the meets level, we're gonna push them to masters. And of course, we're gonna to continue to build on the accomplishments of the uh, kids that are currently uh, displaying uh, master level performance. And so in the campus improvement plan, one of the things that is unique about our campus is that our master schedule allows for all of our students to receive math and reading every day uh, through a double block. And so we feel pretty good about that because that will assist us will, with addressing our students on the tier one uh, level. Uh, also, the kids that were identified for tier two and tier three, they, in addition to um, double blocking of math in ELA, they also get interventions, reading and enrichment, and also numeracy um, uh, intervention classes. So we feel real good about that. And now we're using Edgenuity as a platform to drive our school-wide interventions. And what that means is, is this. Kids arrive on campus at 9 o'clock. The first class starts at 940. And so we want to maximize instructional time. And so what we're going to incorporate is the Patriot Power Hour from 9 to 940, where we have already identified different content areas for every day of the week. So then that way, kids can get on Edgenuity, and they can actually um, work on courses that have been created by what we consider to be our instructional and tech team and continue to move forward. And so that way, kids are not just sitting in class uh, idle. They are actually working towards the goals that I just mentioned. We're also excited about the waiver that came from 21st century. We're going to team up and continue to build on the successes of the campus. And so we're meeting with 21st century to ensure that they're a part of our intervention plan. The next thing that I want to highlight, to go back to what I started off with, um, our new teachers, two years, 48%, two years or less. And so we know that we have to put the time in to ensure that we continue to bridge the gaps, but also make sure that they're delivering quality instruction each and every day. And so our focus is going to be on the four PLCs, DDAP, planning, learning, and also practice PLCs. And we feel like this will be well, excuse me, this will provide a framework to build teacher capacity, uh, increase academic rigor, respond faster to the needs of our students. And again, it's very important that every day, all of our tested content areas will have an opportunity to plan, okay? Our next one is, is uh, just closing the gaps for our ELL students. Right now, we're very excited because our ELL students receive over 150 minutes of ELA and language acquisition uh, instruction daily. The other thing is, is that we're continuously uh, partnering with our multilingual department to ensure that 100% of our teachers are either SOP trained or possess an ESL certification. Last but not least, we talk about literacy across all content areas. And so we hired some additional staff, including an instructional aide to provide additional support in all the core content areas. Now, I talked about uh, some of the resources that we've used, like Edgenuity and all those things, but I'm gonna highlight some of the resources that we have on campus. And so we, feel, we also feel very good about the writer's workshop that we're incorporating. That's gonna be led by our very own, Ms. Daphne Wilson, who has already, um, had major successes, not only on the district level, but from the campus level. And she'll, she's gonna be leading this area, but just to add to that, uh, the master schedule allows for writing instructions to take place daily. Uh, teachers model, will model writing, engage students uh, in shared writing and confer with students around their writing. And then we're gonna put an explicit focus on grammar instruction to enable success on the revising and editing uh, portion of the STAR. Now, these next two strategies are gonna be basically focused focus on um, social emotional. And I know that's one of the things that we talked about. Uh, during this pandemic, I always tell my teachers, we have to give them a little, a little more. Uh, we can't just look at it from you know, passing or failing, right? We have to do things that are actually bridging the gaps and assisting our kids um, in the classroom and also in the community. And so one of the things is, is that we, um, our counselors, are going into classes and they, they're delivering uh, the social and emotional lessons to kids. And then right then and there, doing that opportunity, kids have you know, 
uh, counselors that's in the room with them to where they can just put the academics to the side and actually have real life conversations with them. And so that's where we can find out more about what our kids need, not only from an academic standpoint, but from a social and emotional standpoint. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I wanna highlight within this is, is that the Troy Project. I wanna go back to the Troy Project because this is very important to me. Um, it's actually stands, it's an acronym that actually stands for Transitioning and Redirecting Our Youth. We've identified 50 students on campus. And what we did was we said, teachers, all of the kids that you see that are making bad choices or whatever else, send them to us. And we've identified these kids and we've placed them in leadership roles to where they're not only doing things on campus, but they're actually going to go through out in the community. And every month they have a different initiative. More importantly, as we're building leadership in our students, we also identified four staff members to lead each letter in the acronym. And so now we're doing, it's, in, it's empowerment all the way across um, through all levels. And we know that it will have a positive impact on uh, campus culture. And last but not least, I'm gonna talk about parent engagement because there's another initiative that I am very excited about. And one of the things that we are going around campus and we're talking about is join the Patriot PAC. That's another acronym that we feel very good about which stands for parents, academics, athletics, and community. And again, we have identified four uh, campus leaders on campus that will lead each letter in that acronym. And every month they have to come up with a different initiative to where they're embracing not only the school, but also the community. And so we're continually just sitting down, thinking of ideas of how we can bridge the gap and continue to build on, um, to build a positive culture. And so, with all of those things that we basically discuss, we have seen some improvements on our campus. And some of those improvements is increased teacher confidence and instructional delivery. I know when we first started off, you know, teachers were very nervous about how are they gonna embrace kids at home and kids that were in the classroom. And so as we continue to, to give them um, professional development, we see that they're easy in class and they're, they're starting to embrace all of the challenges. Uh, more importantly, we uh, feel that these strategies will have a faster response time to students' needs. Uh, basically, looking at data on a daily basis and, and making data-driven decisions. We're seeing increased staff buy-in and participation in PLCs. Before, in at-bats, everyone was nervous. You know, when I come in, they were nervous and like, hey, I don't want to present. But now they're getting more comfortable, right? So we're building confidence. And last but not least, we're seeing an increase in parent participation. Um, all those, um, during the time frame when we had challenges with Chromebooks and all those things, we actually set up drive-bys where we took staff members and placed them on the bus ramps. And so all throughout the day, parents who were struggling and, and, and needed additional assistance, they were able to drive by and get a one-on-one -on -one, uh, either coaching or assistance. And that had a very positive impact on campus culture. And so I know I said a lot, um, but I'm very excited. And like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm here to embrace the challenges. And I believe that all of these strategies will yield great results. Um, thank you for giving me this opportunity to present. And I am ready um, at this time to answer any questions as needed. Mr. Lede, uh, it's Debbie Jensen here. <laughs> How you doing? And I was taking notes while you were talking. There's just so many things here, but uh, I'm really interested in your tiered instruction because uh, as adults and as students, I think we've all been in classes where, uh, like I, I was in a ed tech class once where some teachers didn't know how to turn on a computer, whereas other teachers, you know, were just masters already at ed tech. And then the present presenter was trying to give a course that was just set, you know, and it was just ridiculous. You know, uh, I, I really appreciate that you're trying to uh, uh, push those tears along. And uh, can you give me some specific examples in any subject uh, about some of this tiered instruction? Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay, so right now, um, basically from, I'll, I'll give you reading and, um, um, reading and math. So right now what's happening is, is twice a week um, students are engaged in small groups 
um, to where you know we have uh, math fellows, we have ELA interventionists that come in and provide extra support to our students. So now, instead of teachers delivering instruction to a large group of students, we, we have three individuals that's in the classroom that's able to assist. And that's, they get assistance from face-to-face -face as well as, as online. And so that's one of the examples um, that goes with the tiered level of interventions. Uh, that it sounds exciting to me. Uh, I've observed many, many uh, middle school math classes, and the most frustrating thing for me sometimes is to see a student who is actually uh, a little slow doing the activity, but they're getting it. You can see they're piecing it together, and the teacher says, okay, time to go to the next thing, and I'm going, no, you know, <laughs> they were getting it. <laughs> Let them go through this process, so I'm excited for you. The other thing Thank is, with all those new teachers, boy, am I a believer in the PLCs, I think, uh, and also the at-bat, where they actually have to teach lessons to each other, I, I, I think there is just such a rich and self uh, mutually supportive environment there that uh, really helps uh, new teachers become great teachers. Thank you so much. Mr. Lede, again, congratulations. I'm really glad you're at BAML. Um, thank you, sir. They needed, a, they needed a strong principal at BAML. So thank you for taking on that challenge. I also really appreciate the initiatives, particularly the SEL, which I'd like to hear more about. Uh, you guys, BAMA was featured a year or two ago um, for their work with restorative circles. Um, and so I'm curious about how that ongoing program is going, whether we're starting to see sort of repetitive in institutional culture develop as the older kids move upward with that program. Um, and so, and also to echo what Dr. Jensen said, when you had, I thought I heard you say 48% of your teachers two years or less. Is that right? Yeah, so I know I actually just started to get sort of halfway good in my second year. And so the PLCs and, and the, the professional development support is gonna be really important on that campus. So, um, but yeah, I'd like to hear a bit more about uh, how SEL is working on the campus. It, at this particular time, it is, it is very beneficial. One of the things that I'm very proud about is that, um, like in addition um, to the restorative circles, the PBIS rewards. That's something that really had a, a positive impact. And I would like to highlight one of the administrators, uh, Mr. Jared Collins. He's taken it to a whole nother level this year. And he's actually the person that's leading the Troy Project. But to be honest with you, we're not um, eliminating that at all. Actually, we're adding to that. Um, we've, we've even put another layer on there to where before we do anything with discipline, um, you have to bring kids not only through a restorative circle, but also mediations, um, and, and, and not only with students, but also parents. And so just to add to that, yes, we're, we're, everything, um, is, is based on incentives. And so we're going to continue to build on the restorative circles, but yes, sir, that thing, we're, we're still moving forward with all of those initiatives. Thank you. I, you know, like I, we have some, some hierarchy of needs issues, especially in the campuses. We're coming off of all the, the hurricanes and the pandemic. So, you know, you got, you got to have it in your heart on that campus. And so again, I appreciate you being there. No problem. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Great okay. Work. Great work. Thank you. So in, in summation, I know you've heard from the principals. One of the things that we are going to go back and do is um, go back and look at the overall goals. Mm -hmm. um, it's nothing wrong with the strategies necessarily that they've developed. It's just really the end outcome and the expectation um, from an equity lens. And so um, we're going to ask you all to go ahead and approve those. Remember, this is a, a living, breathing document that we can come back to. They're going to tweak them, even change their strategies throughout the year um, based upon how well um, kids are doing. And so we're going to continue to bring this as an update. What I will do is uh, next month, we'll bring this back again, just updating you all on the outcome measures of what we've set from a district standpoint. And then we'll have the campuses go back and realign uh, their final outcome to that as well. Thank you, Dr. Watson.
And thank you, Mr. Walker, um, Ms. Melendez, and Mr. Lede for those presentations. Thank you. Thank you. Job well done. So with no other questions now, I will now entertain a motion that the Board of Trustees approve the Spring Independent School District 2020-2021 Campus Improvement Plans as presented by the administration. I move that the board of trustees approve Spring Independent School District 2020-2021 as presented by the administration. A second. It's been moved by Don Davis and seconded by Kelly Hodges that the Board of Trustees approve the Spring Independent School District 2020-2021 campus improvement plans as presented by the administration. Is there any other discussion? Hearing none, I will now poll the board members for their vote to approve the Spring Independent School District 2020-2021 campus improvement plan as presented by the administration. Winford Adams, Jr. Aye. Kelly Hodges? Aye. Deborah Jensen? Aye. Justine Durant? Aye. Jana Gonzalez? Aye. Don Davis? Aye. And myself, Rhonda Newhouse, vote aye. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you, board. For our next item, I'd like to again recognize our Chief Financial Officer, Ann Westbrooks. Thank you, President Newhouse. On Thursday evening, we spent some time discussing the changes to the tax rate calculation and adoption requirements as a result of House Bill 3. A public notice regarding the budget and the proposed tax rate was posted in the Houston Chronicle on June 10th, and a public hearing was held to approve the budget on June 23rd. Tonight, we're seeking the board's approval of the 2020 tax rate of 1.3843, which is a decrease in the total tax rate of just over four and a half cents. However, it's higher than our no new revenue rate and thus is effectively an increase. We are asking the board to adopt a 2020 maintenance and operations tax rate of 0.9343 to support the general fund budget and an interest in sinking tax rate of 0.45 to support the debt service fund. And so again, we're seeking the board's approval of a 2020 tax rate that's a total of 1.3843 cents, which is a decrease of four and a half percent over the total tax rate in 2019. And is there any questions? Ms. Westbrook, is this the vote where uh, we can get a penny of tax if we're unanimous? Yes, ma'am. Yes, it is. Thank you. Thank you for recognizing that and reminding us of that. Uh, uh, can we reiterate that for Trustee Hodges? Go ahead. Repeat that for Trustee yeah, Hodges. Just that. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. So as part of House Bill 3, there was an additional golden penny that is available as a part of the total tax rate that will yield additional tax revenue locally as well as some additional state revenue um, because it's a golden penny and golden pennies yield more revenue than other parts of, of the tax rate. And so it requires a unanimous vote by the board in order for us to be able to levy that additional penny. And it's included in that total tax rate that we're seeking the board's approval on tonight to reach that total rate of 1.3843. And thank you so much for, for bringing that up again. Thank you. Um, Ms. Westbrook, I also like to refer to that community impact newspaper article. Uh, it compared spring to surrounding districts and we have the lowest tax rate. And so the, thank you so much, Dr. Jensen, for sharing that article with us. And so I, our taxpayers in Spring ISD's boundaries pay less than overall total taxes. Our um, average 
homeowners or residents is about $147,000 in the 2020 school year. So based on the taxable value of uh, the average home in the spring ISD school district's boundaries, our taxpayers pay less, less overall total taxes. Thank you. I will now entertain a motion that the Board of Trustees approve that the property tax rate be increased by the adoption of a tax rate of 1.3843, which is effectively a 4.32% increase in the tax rate, and the Board approve the 2020 tax rate audience and resolution. Madam President, I move the Board of Trustees approve the property tax rate be increased by the adoption of a tax rate of 1.3843, which is effectively a 4.32% increase in the tax rate, and that the Board approve the 2020 tax rate accordance and resolution. Do I have a second? Second. It's been moved by Jenna Gonzalez and seconded by Winfred Adams that the property tax rate be increased by the adoption of a tax rate of 1.3843, which is effectively a 4.32% increase in the tax rate, and that the board approve the 2020 tax rate ordinance and resolution. Is there any other discussion? Hearing none, I will now poll the board members for their vote for this approved that the tax property tax rate be increased by the adoption of a tax rate of 1.3843, which is effectively a 4.32% increase in the tax rate, and that the board approve the 2020 tax rate audits and resolution. Winford Adams, Jr. Second. Um, aye. Kelly Hodges. <laughs> aye. Deborah Jensen. Aye. Justine Durant. Aye. Jana Gonzalez. Aye. Donald Davis. Aye. And myself, Rhonda Newhouse, votes aye. So the motion carries unanimously. And Ms. Westbrooks, I highlight unanimously. <laughs> So thank you, thank you Ms. Westbrooks. <laughs> Will you continue with your next item? Yes, ma'am. And thank you all for um, the unanimous vote. Thank you very much for that. And we will prepare our tax statements and have them in the mail to our community members because I know they're waiting on those to show up um, towards the end of this week. So we'll, we'll get that handled. The next item that we have on the agenda tonight is um, a request for the board's approval for an interlocal agreement with Harris County to participate in a program that's called Project 10 Million. And so early on in the pandemic and for quite some time, uh, the board has provided us with the guidance and the charge to find every opportunity to close the digital gap for our students. And so any opportunity that we have to bring more resources to our students so that their focus can be on instruction and they have every resource available to them for the highest level of achievement. We're asking the board to give us the ability to enter into this local interlocal agreement with Harris County, similar to what we did with the Operation Connectivity interlocal agreement. And what it will do is provide a maximum of 5,297 hotspots for our students within Spring ISD. And that would be in addition to the already close to about, I think, 4,500 hotspots that we have currently available for our students. And it will also allow us to have to receive an additional 5,297 5, laptops for our students, not Chromebooks, but laptops that we can use for a, a multitude of reasons. So I see from the hand claps that I think we'll, we'll get approval for that this evening. And so everything is time sensitive. So once we receive the board's approval, we'll give Harris County the, the green light and we'll be able to start getting those resources in the district for our students. Thank you, Ms. Westbrooks. 
I will now entertain a motion that the Board of Trustees approve the interlocal agreement with Harris County to participate in Project 10 million and authorize the superintendent to sign any necessary agreements and related documents. Madam President, I move that the Board of Trustees approve the interlocal agreement with Harris County to participate in Project 10 million and authorize the superintendent to sign any necessary agreements and related documents. Do I have a second? Second. It's been moved by Deborah Jensen, second by Winfred Adams, that the Board of Trustees approve the interlocal agreement with Harris County to participate in Project 10 million and authorize the superintendent to sign in necessary agreements and related documents. Is there any discussion? Questions or discussions? I think we are excited. So I will now poll the board members for their vote to approve the interlocal agreement with Harris County to participate in Project 10 million and authorize the superintendent to sign any necessary agreements and related documents. Winfred Adams, Jr. Aye. Kelly Hodges. Aye. Deborah Jensen. Aye. Justine Durant. Aye. Jana Gonzalez. Aye. Donald Davis. Aye. And myself, Rhonda Newhouse, votes <laughs> aye. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. We're all excited about those additional devices and hotspots. Um, the last item that I have for the board this evening is consideration of an interlocal agreement with Aldine ISD. And so we've talked a lot about asynchronous and synchronous instruction and the, the mode of that instruction and what impact it has on attendance and how we ultimately receive our funding for our students within the district while we're in this pandemic and this remote learning environment. For our students that are, that are joining us remotely from home, all of our campuses have done a remarkable job of having synchronous instruction as part of the day for our students that are, that are joining us remotely. And so when our students join remotely through synchronous instruction, our teachers are taking attendance at that moment in time, just like whether the students on campus or if they're online, the teachers take in attendance. For our students that are not joining us, for whatever reason, for those synchronous, those synchronous instruction sec sections, but they turn in an assignment or they engage in communication with their teacher, or they do one of those engagement activities that TA allows for asynchronous instruction, we can still count attendance for those students through 11.59 p.m. of that day and still count them present. So we're in order to capture that asynchronous engagement, we're utilizing two system platforms. We have Schoology, our learning management system that we've talked about quite a bit in various ways um, with the Board of Trustees. And also we have eSchool, which is our student information system. Well, the platform for attendance, the official platform that we use to report to the state of Texas is within eSchool. The asynchronous attendance information is in Schoology. So we're working through a process and we have a process in place though it's largely manual, that we're using to capture that asynchronous attendance and push it into eSchool, which is our official um, student attendance software system. And since it's manual, we're getting it done, but we're consistently about three weeks behind. Well, naturally so, we're seeking other resources and other op options of how we can handle this process as is everyone across the state of Texas because we're all in the same boat right now. And it came to our attention that our neighbors over in Aldean had written a program that will take away a lot of the manual portions of the process and automatically moves that information from the Schoology platform into the eSchool platform because they're utilizing both of those same, those same systems. So what we're asking this, this evening is for the board to approve for Spring ISD to enter into that interlocal agreement with all DNISD to have access to that program that their team has written. 
And so I want to be very clear that they're, they have the same software systems that we do, but not necessarily the same setups as Spring, not necessarily the same processes and procedures as Spring. So what this interlocal agreement would do is it would provide us the opportunity to speak directly with Aldine and get access to that program, do our due diligence to see how it fits into our software system, fits into our processes and our procedures. And ultimately, if it's successful, then we would be able to automate a process that we're currently handling manually, which will allow us to report out to you all, the board, to our principals who are always eager to get their attendance information and to our community members that are interested as well the attendance on a much more um, faster at a much faster pace and we would have that information readily available for the multitude of reasons um, that we need the attendance data and so that's the purpose of the interlocal agreement once we receive that if you approve tonight once we receive it we would report back to you on how it's working and whether or not it was successful for us So is this a free partnership here? Almost free, Dr. Jensen. They're charging us $1. $1. Now, those are some nice friends. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we're going to be like beta testers, uh, perhaps. Is this new? It is new and it's it's pretty much homegrown. Aldine wrote it themselves. And so they tested it themselves on their side. So we would be a part of a pilot program to see whether it'll work in other school districts. So in effect, yes, we would be round two of the beta testing. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I, I am not as technically literate as a lot of you people in the uh, systems to run attendance. Uh, but I think that this is, sounds like a absolutely wonderful idea, and I'm so grateful that we have Aldine as neighbors. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you to Aldine, and thank you, Ms. Westbrooks. I will now entertain a motion that the Board of Trustees approve the interlocal agreement with Aldine ISD as presented by the administration and authorize the superintendent to sign any necessary agreements and related documents. Madam President, I move that the Board of Trustees approve the interlocal agreement with Aldean ISD as presented by the administration and authorize the superintendent to sign any necessary agreements and related documents. Do I have a second? second. It's been moved by Kelly Hodges and seconded by Justine Durant that the Board of Trustees approve the interlocal agreement with Aldean ISD as presented by the administration and authorize the superintendent to sign any necessary agreements and related documents. Is there any other discussion? Hearing none, I will now poll the board members for their vote to approve the interlocal agreement with Aldean ISD as presented by the administration and authorize the superintendent to sign any necessary agreements and related documents. Winford Adams, Jr. Aye. Kelly Hodges. Aye. Deborah Jensen. Aye. Justine Durant. Aye. Jana Gonzalez. Aye. Donald Davis. Aye. And myself, Rhonda Newhouse, vote aye. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Westbrooks, and please give our thanks to our neighbors, Aldine, for allowing us to participate in this pilot program. Thank you. Our next item is the consent agenda. I will now entertain a motion to approve and adopt all of the items listed on the consent agenda. Madam President, I move the Board of Trustees approve and adopt all items listed on the consent agenda. Okay. It's been moved by Jana Gonzalez and second by Justine Durant that the Board of Trustees approve and adopt all of the items listed on the consent agenda. Is there any discussion? 
just what you always say, Madam President, that we discuss this at length uh, and uh, uh, we yes. really <laughs> gave it some examination. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, we spent a great amount of time at our work session on Thursday night discussing all of the items on the consent agenda. And I was checking to see if after that discussion and you're going back to review your time Thursday night if there was any discussion. Hearing none, I will now poll the board members for their vote to approve and adopt all of the items listed on the consent agenda. Winfred Adams, Jr. Aye. Kelly Hodges. Aye. Deborah Jensen. Aye. Justine Durant. Aye. Jana Gonzalez. Aye. Don Davis. Aye. And myself, Rhonda Newhouse, votes aye. So the motion carries unanimously. Thank you. The Board of Trustees will now recess this open session and convene in a closed meeting in accordance with the Texas Open Meeting Act, Section 551.071. Texas Open Meeting Act, Section 551.072. Texas Open Meeting Act, Section 551. And Texas Open Meeting Act, Section 551.076. No voting will take place in the closed meeting. Any action the board wishes to take as a result of discussions in the closed meeting will take place after the board reconvenes in closed session. The time is now 8.56 p.m. Thank you. We'll now reconvene and resume the regular meeting of the Board of Trustees. The time is now 10.09 p.m. We will address the items discussed during closed session. Are there any motions? Madam President, I move that the board approve the superintendent's recommendation to propose the termination of the probationary contract of the following employee, Jarvis Harry, as presented in closed session, and to authorize the superintendent or designee to provide the employee notice of the board's action and his rights pursuant to Chapter 21 of the Texas education code. Do I have a second? Second. It's been moved by Justine Durant and second by Jenna Gonzalez that the board approve the superintendent's recommendation to propose the termination of the probationary contract of Jarvis Harry as presented in closed session and to authorize the superintendent or designee to provide the employee notice of the board's action and his rights pursuant to chapter 21 of the Texas Education Code. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. The motion carries unanimously. Are there any other motions? Madam President, I move that the board render a final order to terminate the contract of Erica Thomas as presented in closed session and to authorize the superintendent to provide notice of the board's action to the impacted employee pursuant to chapter 21 of the Texas Education Code. Do we have a second? Second. second. It's been moved by Winfred Adams and second by Deborah Jensen that the board render a final order to terminate the contract of Erica Thomas as presented in closed session and to authorize the superintendent to provide notice of the board's action to the impacted employee pursuant to chapter 21 of the Texas Education Code. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. The board carries unanimously. The motion carries unanimously. Are there any other items on tonight's agenda? Since there are no other items on tonight's agenda, I will now entertain a motion to adjourn our meeting. Madam President, I move to adjourn. Second. Second. It's been moved by Justine Durant, second by John Gonzalez, that the Board of Trustees adjourn this meeting. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. The motion carries unanimously. 
There's no further business. This meeting is officially adjourned at 10, 12 p.m. Thank you.